This week on Surfing the Nash Tsunami. The words I am are two very powerful words. I am a healthy person. I am a fit person. I am a person who chooses lean proteins. You know, how you see yourself and set yourself up to be even. I am deserving of a healthy life. Every week, a global community of fatty liver disease stakeholders comes together to explore the most important challenges in diagnosing, treating, and developing medications for patients with fatty liver diseases. Join hepatology researcher and key opinion leader Dr. Stephen Harrison, liver wellness advocate Louise Campbell, pricing and forecasting guru Roger Green, and this week's guest, Global Liver Institute President and CEO Donna Cryer, as they discuss how to help patients become healthier and why different approaches succeed or fail on the Surfing the Nash Tsunami podcast. For everyone with an interest in Nash or more broadly fatty liver disease, Surf's Up. Season 2, Episode 9 of Surfing the Nash Tsunami starts now. Today's episode of Surfing the Nash Tsunami is sponsored by EchoSense because liver health matters. EchoSense is proud to announce it has joined with Cronwell and Modify Health to launch Liver Healthy a complete system of behavioral and nutrition support and real-time monitoring for overweight or obese NASH patients. Listen at the end of today's episode for an added segment introducing you to Liver Healthy. This is an exciting week for three reasons. First of all, Donna is here, so the band is back together. It's actually an interesting version of the band because Louise is at her NHS job at the Excel Center in London, where she's been working on vaccinations for the program there. But we're all here with good energy, guitar, drums, band, and a lot of excitement, number one. Number two, this episode is sponsored by our friends at EchoSense to introduce a new pilot program called Liver Healthy, which they are developing in conjunction with Cronwell and Modify Health. Now, this brings a combination of monitoring, behavioral support, nutritional support, and food to help people who have multiple metabolic conditions, obesity, fatty liver, diabetes, I think that's the target, manage themselves, learn how to manage themselves, and over time, take responsibility for their own management. So that's going to be the second half of today's session. The third reason this is exciting is, as I mentioned, Louise is at the Excel Center. We have different people recording from different places, and I can't tell you how all the technology is going to go together. So if it winds up sounding a little choppy or like voices are coming from different places. That's because voices are coming from different places. We are really taxing the capabilities of our fantastic engineer, Magic Mike Wilson, this week. He will earn everything we pay him and then a lot more. To set the stage for today, each of our last two episodes discuss patient motivation and adherence to therapy in a world that has a lot of information but no new medications. Two weeks ago, Wayne Eskridge discussed the impact of information overload on the patient, particularly those with diabetes, while Louise and I shared some thoughts about ways to educate and motivate in the presence of that overload and the absence of medication. Last week, Stephen asked Louise specifically about whether and how we can use lessons from the COVID-19 vaccine, specifically the urgency patients expressed to be vaccinated to derive greater interest in weight loss if that can have the same effect on NASH. So this week, we touch on those issues two ways. First, the four of us will discuss what we perceive as challenges in patient motivation and behavior change around getting patients to take better care of themselves and their livers. Second, the Liver Healthy team will present their pilot program as a novel integrated approach to overall patient support and management in today's world. After that, I will return with a back-end section discussing some fantastically positive listener numbers and an excellent response to last week's NASHTAG episode. And with that, let's shift to our opener. Hey, Stephen, welcome back. Hey, Roger. Good to be back. Uh, Back in form, ready to go. Excellent. And uh, Donna, great to have you back. Thank you. I'm glad to be back. I am fit as a fiddle. Excellent. And Louise, welcome back. Start sitting here at the Excel Center trying to work the technology. Great. But it's nice to hear you guys. And you've made it happen. So that's spectacular. Okay. First go around, really simple. Best professional thing or personal for that matter has happened in the last week. Uh, Brave one, go first. Now I'll jump in. Having just joined the conversation, I had my COVID vaccination today. So, um, and feeling absolutely fine. So that's the positive for me this week. Which which one was it? Oxford AstraZeneca. We're keeping it simple here at the Excel. We're we've only got one to just make sure we there's no problems and just go with that. That sounds simple. Good for you. Okay, next. So professionally, in the past week, it was an interesting confluence of my personal patient needs and my years of of professional patient advocacy coming together and seeing them manifest at Academic Medical Center 
in a way that earlier generations of patients could only have imagined was was deeply satisfying to see digital technology leverage to be able to give extremely personalized and personable care. It was just deeply satisfying in terms of the endless government committee meetings and conference rooms around the states and around the world in in which patients like myself worked so hard. And so personally to be able to benefit it was fantastic, but professionally to be able to see the type of care delivered that I always knew could be delivered, it was just beyond satisfying. Okay, that's great, Donna. Stephen, I guess that leaves you before me. I have been working on a research project for the better part of seven years now. This is my NAFLD prevalence study that I started and completed while at Brook Army Medical Center. Actually, I retired and the study continued and then it completed after I retired. But I'm uh, really thrilled to see that it's been accepted into the Journal of Hepatology and will be forthcoming, online ready, hopefully in the next 30 days or so. So really a culmination of about seven years worth of work, about 20 people just really pouring their heart into trying to understand the epidemiology of NAFLD and NASH in a middle-aged cohort of Americans. And I, I think we have it. I think it, it will be an exciting paper to get out there for everybody. So, Stephen, I'm hoping about the time the paper gets out that you and one or two of your collaborators will come serve as guests and walk us through it in some detail on the podcast. That'd uh, be great. I'd love to do it. That's fantastic, Stephen. When appropriate, we'll set a date. We'll tell all our listeners about it and go ahead with what I am sure will be a fascinating, educating episode. Personal. My personal news is like Louise's. I also got my first dose of the vaccine this past week. Mine was Pfizer-BioNTech. Jorn Schottenberg, if you're listening, thanks to your colleagues and minds for developing this vaccine. I will not have adequate immunity fast enough to attend NASHTAG in person, which is disappointing. I really wished I could have gone. We'll be covering remote instead. But I am on the road to protection, which is really uplifting. With that, why don't we go on to the podcast? So, as I said, Liver Healthy, which, which uh, we'll talk about later, combines three elements, a monitoring element through fiber scan and probably blood work, and a lot of technology to support the um, GI and GI nurses in, in helping patients, and then nutritional counseling. He says, basically, there are two ways to think about this. You could think about a habit as being outcome-based or identity-based. So in the context of dieting, um, you might want to lose 50 pounds. You might have an outcome to lose 50 pounds, or you might have an identity. And that identity might be to be a healthier person, to do a better job for your grandkids, whatever. But losing the weight becomes a way to do that. And then you have a process to get you there. So it's in the process that the goal of the exercise starts to come out. For example, the comedian Jackie Gleason once said that he was the world champion all-time weight loser because over the course of his life, he'd lost 1,000 pounds, by which he meant the same 50 pounds 20 times. If your identity is to be a champion weight loser, then you're going to take an outcome-based approach and the one that gets you the 50 pounds down as quickly as possible, say a starvation diet. When I had to lose 50 pounds, my goal was to lead a healthier lifestyle. Specifically, it was to be able to ski with my kids, but that was just the example that ultimately became about the whole lifestyle. And if that's what you're trying to do, then a starvation diet doesn't make a lot of sense because it's not a healthy way to live, number one. Number two, the day after you've lost the 50 pounds, the objective you used in pursuing it matters tremendously. If the outcome was to lose 50 pounds and you lose the 50 pounds, then to be the world champion weight loser, you have to gain the 50 back again so you can lose the 50 again. Now that's extreme, but that's a point. If the goal is is to live a healthy life, then you ask yourself how to manage your consumption of food, alcohol, and exercise and all that to do so. Trust me, it's a lot more exciting to watch your weight go down two pounds a week than to watch it stay stable. So you need actually to view stability as part of a bigger picture to make that an exciting and rewarding thing to do. Fundamentally, what these two approaches mean is that you can take an outcome-based approach, decide what you want to do, develop a plan to do it. Once you get there, ask yourself, what do you want to do next? Maybe you don't know, or maybe you don't know how to do it. Or there's an identity-based approach, which is decide who you want to be, prove it with a series of small wins that support the life you want to live, and keep becoming that person and make the wins bigger over time. With that, and the limitations of the role of a doctor, for example, it might be easier for the doctor to do the second, but for it to work, the doctor has to figure, or be outcome-based. But for it to work, the doctor also, I think, needs to be identity-based. And with that, before we listen to our colleagues, our friends from Liver Healthy describe their program, I want to go back to the identity issue and I want to ask, so what about that makes sense? And what about that seems off base in the context of what we're talking about today? Brave one, go first. From a clinical perspective, I think it makes complete sense. Most of the time when patients walk into my clinic with a diagnosis of NASH, they are mid-50s. 
late 40s, you know, to mid 60s, somewhere mean av- some average of around 50, 55, something like that. And after we get through the diagnosis and we start talking prognosis and then we start talking treatment, one of the first conversations is on lifestyle modification and foundationally changing the way they've been doing things. And I look at them and I say, look, I let you do it your way for 55 years. And this is where we are today. Now I need you to do it the colonel's way. And I'm going to walk through what that looks like. But I need you to be all in. I need you to change who you are, change the way you think about things, the way you think about food, the way you think about exercise, the way you think about your typical daily routine. It all now needs to change with a focus on your metabolic health. And and so, yeah, I think that that first observation is spot on. And as we get through this, we can talk about the value of positive reinforcement and feedback that allows patients to continue to focus on that changed identity, which I think is really critical to success in losing weight, maintaining weight. So I'd like to add, I'd like to reinforce the issue of identity. The words I am are two very powerful words. I am a healthy person. I am a fit person. I am a person who chooses lean proteins. You know, how you see yourself and set yourself up to be even. I am deserving of a healthy life. I am a person who moves. All of those aspects of creating a sense of identity are are very important. And I'd like to add to that the concept of why. Why are you doing this? Why is losing weight or changing your behaviors important now? It could be because I want to be a good patient for, you know, for Colonel, Colonel Harrison. That may be sufficient why. It could be that I want to live a long life for my family. It could be that I want to be more productive at work. But I think identifying the why for people is so important to helping them hold on to and sustain behaviors when times get hard or when it it seems so easy to do something different or to fall back into old habits or or you know or choose choose something that hasn't served you well in the past holding on to that why as you reset your your identity i think is an important element of that. The, the third thing I might want to say as we provide some context for thinking about this weight loss in the context of, of NAFLD and NASH particularly, and what it would take for something to stick for somebody to be successful. You know, I'm very mindful that this is Obesity Care Week, and at least as we're talking about this and initially putting this episode to, together. And so much of this work in the obesity space to support people is to take away the bias and stigma, but to replace it with the evidence, both of why people would want to make these changes because they see a visualization of the damage to their liver or their changes in their blood sugar levels and moving it to the the metrics of why for your health is a very important part to take this out of the stigmatization or this is about vanity or about moving people to somebody else's idealization of of perfection or or what healthy should look like and move it into really concrete issues of of health and, and evidence. And the other part of this that we'll talk through that are so essential that we're advocating for and and discussing with policymakers this week is to make sure that all of the tools that we know help people be successful, whether that's behavioral supports or access to a dietitian or weight loss medications or gastric surgeries, whatever it is for that individual that needs to be successful, it recognizing that it's so much more than just telling somebody to lose weight, that there are structures and tools and therapies that are available that have been too infrequently applied and provided to people to support them as they choose this direction. So I'm really excited about this conversation and and think that there is so much more that we can be putting together that we're able to put together for, for people that we have in the past. So Louise, we go back one week and you were talking about feedback. 
and the different kinds of feedback that you found people need in order to be able to maintain. Do you want to comment on that a little bit in addition to whatever else you're thinking about saying? I think when you relate back to last week, Stephen was asking a specific question in relation to losing weight for COVID and the COVID-19 vaccine. So I think it's one of those things that whilst I agree with absolutely everything everybody said so far, we are talking about people who have already been diagnosed with NASH and NAFLD. And I think it is really important to continue the feedback that people get when they're diagnosed. But I think we've related a previous episode to we don't get to see these people enough. And I think it's really important that we start to see people more often to keep that motivation going. As Stephen says, most of the patients that are diagnosed are between 40 and 60, so mid-50s. Whilst it's not too late to change a lot of people's well-established habits, it is extremely difficult. So I do think we have to start earlier. We need to constantly reinforce the positive positive change that somebody makes earlier because they make positive change and go backwards. We need to give them the evidence. And yes, I use Fibroscan, but it's very compelling evidence and people are very competitive when they see their own scores coming down. So I give them feedback and the changes they make can achieve things. Sometimes it's weight loss and we do focus on weight loss a lot. We know that weight loss works, but for some individuals, it's just the quality of the diet and changing small things about their diet can make big changes. And again, by measuring those, it can change the internal liver fat that's reinforcing to patients. A couple of questions. Listening to all those data, Louise, I, I feel that the conversation before that was about how do you motivate the individual patient or how do you motivate somebody to work with their family members or their immediately closest people? I'm wondering, the data that you share are compelling and scary, but I'm wondering who those data will motivate and how we turn any element of that message into a force for motivation. I don't know about Stephen, but whenever I have scanned either an adult or a child for the first time to tell them they've got a lot of fat in their liver, they are actually horrified. And it is one of the most influential appointments that somebody can have. And I think what you see in these people and these individuals is what can I do about it? What can I change now? And it is really, really motivating to me as a healthcare professional to have somebody want to know that. Listening to you and, and thinking about Roger's question about whom would these data resonate, I think liver health is public health. And what you've just discussed reinforces that point. And so my mind first went to recess and childhood activity and, and structures to support that. Now we need to get people, we need to get kids back into school for them to be a recess, I, re I recognize. But the fact that, you know, in the before times, recess had been cut, at least in the United States, in, in many locations. And so the amount of activity that children were getting in the course of their day was so low that that contributed to that. And then the second part of that are, are structures around school lunches and federally supported food policy, whether through the Department of Agriculture or, or others. And so I think we're, we're rightly turning this conversation from the individual and family su support and, and decisions, which are important, of course. But how can we set up the structure of the environment and ecosystem to be pro-healthy food, pro-movement, so that people have a better chance of being successful. And so it's not so much dependent on whether they are educated as to their optimal percentage of macros, but we make it easy for people to do the healthy thing. Roger mentioned atomic habits. You know, one of my favorite books has always been Nudge about uh, structuring whether the placement of apples in, in school cafeterias or, or other things to make healthy foods the easier, more intuitive choice to make. So I think we need to do a better job in terms of the public health structure and policy structure and environment that even does control some of the, the you know, the advertising and the messages that people are giving. But I, I think education only takes you so far. We need to make it easy to take action. I completely agree from a 30,000 foot view approaching this from, you know, a policy perspective is, is important. I can't speak from, from that, that angle of it. I, I can speak more from the individual patient perspective. And to me, it's all about, you know, just following on that change mentality, that changing the identity. You know, I think for me, it's a circle. I, the paradigm is you, I think I said this on one of the very first podcasts we have, you know, you know how many psychiatrists it takes to change a light bulb? And the answer is one, but the light bulb has to want to change. And 
really it's all about getting the patient to want to change. And for some people, that's scaring them, saying, look, I'm really concerned about your liver disease based on the compendium of data I have before me today, your fiber scan, your liver enzymes, your albumin, your INR, your PT, your risk factors, your family history, and it's time for a change. And helping them to realize that it's time for a change. And then it's positive feedback. And that's so critically important to me. I mean, I'm 52. I I love positive feedback, but it can go both ways, right? I belly up to a pack of Oreo cookies. I'm going to have a mental state that, you know, two weeks from now, I really remember those Oreo cookies tasting well or waffle fries from Chick-fil-A, you know, smell good, taste good, got to have them, bring it on. That that mental image when you drive by Chick-fil-A is one that brings back these uh, your senses of how positive that was. So we have to create that on the lifestyle modification front. And that's how we motivate these people. And I think where we can provide positive feedback through showing them an image that they can put on the refrigerator and that they drop their CAP score, that they drop their KPA or their ALT is dropped or it's normalized is important. And then they get that from positive feedback, they, you know, they get positive reflections. And what I mean by that is how do you feel? How do you feel losing that weight? You have more energy, more stamina. How do you look? Do you like the way you look? Your clothes fit better. People comment in a more positive way when you walk by them or you have a conversation with them. And what that leads to is a persistence and a perseverance to continue those lifestyle changes. Look, there's only so many liver docs in the world. There's only only so many people that can get out there and advocate and coach, mentor, and lead these people. So first of all, what Louise and what Donna are doing are phenomenal because they're able to take that and leverage it and, and really get to the masses. Whereas a physician typically changes the world one patient at a time. And and like tomorrow, I have 15 people in clinic. I will be buried in clinic all day, and then I'll take three days to write the clinic notes. So I'm impacting those people, but it's not to the same level. And I think what we do is we impact these people, and then those people go out and share the good news, the great joy about how they were impacted, and we begin to spread it that way. But that that's kind of the way I reflect on getting a, a person to change, giving them positive feedback, reflecting on how they feel, and that maintains a persistent attitude towards change. That's interesting. Uh, uh, let me try to pull some of this together, at least the way it's coming together in my mind. Everybody has to believe this is doable. If patients don't believe it's doable, it is going to happen. If their personal supports believe it isn't doable, they'll see that in the eyes of the people they look at and they will feel defeated. If doctors don't feel it's doable, they won't put in the time. If policy people don't think it's doable, they won't put in the money. They won't study the investment. So number one, I think everybody needs to believe this is an achievable goal. And then they will act in different ways. Um, I know, I think I'm probably the only person on this call who's had experience losing large amounts of weight. Um, but one of the things I remember when I started that I've paid for for the rest of my life is when I was just starting, I'd be in the gym and I'd be working out. But I'd be telling myself what I was doing wasn't very impressive because I used to do a lot better when I was younger and thinner, blah, 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 blah. And someone who looked a lot better than me would come over and say, you know, that's great what you're doing. Um, I used to look like that. Now I look like this. And you can do it. I found that stuff very compelling. I now do that every time I'm in a gym, if I see anybody who's trying to get into a regimen like that, to play forward the idea that positive experience is transferable. And yes, you can do it. Yes, you can make it work. So I, I think that's a common theme in all of this. Everybody has to believe it can be done and needs to be done, number one. Uh, the second thought I've got, Stephen, is stick around. When we stick around, I think, for the second half, uh, the, the last part of this, um, one of the things I think they will be talking about is technology as an enabler within the medical office to help a medical staff provide more support for the same number of patients. I think there's that model. We've talked on the show several times about Noom and programs like that, which are patient-centered, but they're software as a service, and they're all and they're app-based, and they're all technology-enabling. So it becomes an interesting question to me, to what degree can we take the powerful motivation that professionals can bring? whether they're you or whether they're Louise, and use technology to get more bang for the buck and more people uh, benefiting from one spark of insight, one spark of passion, one spark of brilliance? It's an interesting question in the context of the extra sode that you're doing, because when I left healthcare, Towers and Health was developed to do exactly that to help with that motivation. So in addition to the high quality clinical scanning that we do, it's lifestyle and wellness. We're making this accessible for everybody without a referral, 
to have access to this information which motivates and changes behaviour to prevent people becoming affected by NAFLD and NASH because they can manage their own lifestyle. So if you want to go on your new programme, you can come and have your fibre scan before. We can then alter and actually show the benefits that you have achieved on any of these programmes. And it was interesting that on Noon's release, their best-selling product is actually a four-month membership. We started talking at the beginning of the episode about changing people's entire lifestyles and that in a person. However, most people do short, sharp episodes of healthy lifestyle and then go back to previous lifestyle but can do short sharp episodes but actually by being available to everybody we can actually measure those and i think i'd like to see that becoming the norm because most people do not make it through a hospital process to get to see the likes of Stephen or the physicians I've worked with or even the nurses that I've worked with to have these tests. I do think the key to that sustainability, and it's fascinating to think of four months as a short period of time, as I've been in the process, particularly this year, in a, in a more intentional way than others in, in creating some new habits. But I, I think that issue of identity that we talked about at the beginning, the I am, is really the key to long-term change. And maybe I'll do it as I am not. I am not a person who drinks sodas. They don't come in our house. It's not a decision that I make on a regular basis. I am not a person who drinks soda. It's not part of my identity. So, you know, I don't get the decision fatigue. It's not something that I'm worried about five months from now is going to change. And so I, I think that reset of identity is the shift that needs to be made and, and, and cultivated in, in people, something that they can live with and something that is authentic. Authentic. I am a person who eats cookies, but I make it very hard to make them. I don't keep them in the house. There's there's some dough in the bottom drawer of the refrigerator. And if I want a cookie, I have to turn on the oven and make two cookies. But I think that reset of identity, I am now a person who Pelotons. Somebody can be, you know, I am a person who walks the dogs every day. And, and I think that that reset of identity is really the key to sustainability. Choosing the bone broth as I did over the protein bar that has a lot of sugar in it, I've realized is a harder decision for all of the reasons that Stephen described about the wonderfulness of Chick-fil-A and other goodies. But that's where the why I'm making the changes comes in handy and helps me stick. So I think focusing on those sustainability points and that that reset of identity and, and anchoring people from the beginning and in the plan that we set about. So again, you know, moving beyond just you know, what to do, but why are you doing it? And who's the type of person who does these things and, and, and visualizing yourself as that person and becoming that person is, is what all of these uh, and, and the feedback loops showing yourself on the path to becoming that person and, and the, you know, small successes, maybe it's not a change in weight, but change in lean body mass or, or, or something that uh, helps you go along the way is important to that sustainability, but we do need to build it to last from the beginning, and we too often do not. I think that's a great point on which to start to close, because I also know what time everybody's got to wrap up today. I want to ask a different closing question. I want to go back to what Donna was saying about I am. Take a minute and tell us one statement that begins I am and one statement that begins I am not. Where those statements define the way you look every day at being healthy or being however healthy you are. And I'll start. I am a person who chooses to walk a healthy path and learn healthier processes over time. I am not going to give into this outrageous sweet tooth that I have. And those two statements actually have a lot to do with how I run a lot of my life around, around health and wellness and all that stuff. I am a dancer. Started ballet and tap and jazz from a little child, and that is my most essential expression of movement. So I am a dancer. Knee replacements notwithstanding, it is my core belief. I am not someone who can afford to replace my entire wardrobe in a larger size. That is my I am not. That's pretty practical. Stephen or Louise. So I am committed to educating patients about the negative consequences of fatty liver disease. I am not going to be a statistic related to this liver disease. Okay. And Louise? I am a lazy athlete. <laughs> <laughs> I have always been naturally fit, but I am absolutely lazy at um, if it takes effort. But I am not going to give in to not doing some exercise to keep mobile and to keep healthier. And with that, let me thank 
all three of you for dealing with some rather um, fascinating technical challenges. At the end of this episode, I might talk for a minute about all the technicals that people have to deal with. And um, we will move our crew out. Donna will stick around and we will move in the next crew and start talking about uh, liver healthy. Donna, Louise, thank you so much. See you next week. Now our friend, hepatology researcher, and key opinion leader Dr. Mazen Nuruddin joins us along with executives from EchoSense, Cronwell, and Modify Health to introduce us to Liver Healthy. So welcome back for the second part of today's episode of Surfing the Next Tsunami. Our friends at EchoSense are sponsoring what we describe as an extra sode, a 25-30 minute piece at the end, to introduce our audience to a new program called Liver Healthy that EchoSense is sponsoring along with Cronwell and Modify Health. Along with us also are our good friends Donna Cryer and Amaza Nuruddin, who will serve as panelists today. And what we're going to do for the extra episode is pretty simple. Dr. Frias is going to speak for about five minutes on some of the underpinnings of this program and why it makes sense. I will then turn the floor over to our good friend Jerry Mabry, who will introduce his partners, and they will talk for about five or ten minutes on the program and the role that each company plays in it. And then Mazen and Donna and I will come back and ask the panelists questions about all that. So with that, Dr. Frias, do me a favor, take a minute and introduce yourself to everybody a little bit about your background, and then please go ahead. Okay. Hello, my name is Juan Frias. I'm an endocrinologist in Los Angeles, California, where I run a clinic and a clinical research center. And our patient population is primarily patients with type 2 diabetes and obesity. And clearly, these patients are at very high risk of fatty liver disease. So we, we treat this disorder in our clinic and also are studying a number of pharmacological interventions and clinical trials as well. Okay, thanks. And what are you going to be speaking to our audience about today exactly? So we'll be talking about the importance of identifying fatty liver disease and identifying it early in order to prevent, hopefully, its progression, and the importance, particularly of weight loss, so of medical nutrition therapy and healthy diet, as well as physical activity in not only attaining a better weight, but by doing so, improving fatty liver disease and many other comorbid conditions, such as cardiovascular disease as well. Great. And... Um... The microphone is yours. Um, what would you like to share with us on that subject? So I practice in an uh, area of Los Angeles where there are a lot of Hispanic patients. Most of my patients have type 2 diabetes, prediabetes, and obesity, so a very high prevalence of fatty liver disease. And this is generally asymptomatic. And although it's silent, though, it can have very deleterious clinical consequences. So it's very important to identify it and to address fatty liver disease. These patients have an increased risk of cardiovascular vascular disease, increased risk of obesity-related cancers, including hepatocellular carcinoma, should it progress to the more advanced um, NASH, or non-alcoholic steatohepatitis. And, uh, you know, anecdotally, certainly in my practice, um, patients with fatty liver disease and type 2 diabetes are just more difficult to treat. And I think, again, it's very important to identify because there's something we can do about it with respect to slowing down the progression from steatosis, or fat in the liver, to non-alcoholic steatohepatitis, or the more advanced form where there's inflammation, hepatocyte damage, and potentially fibrosis and some of the negative effects that go with that. And when I look at this in my clinical practice, I really think of it as I do pre-diabetes progressing to type 2 diabetes. So those patients really need lifestyle intervention, weight reduction, and we can oftentimes reduce the progression of type 2 diabetes or even regress prediabetes and get patients down to normal glucose tolerance. And that's my thought process when I find patients, which are many of my patients given their risk factors with fatty liver disease and have so-called simple steatosis, to try to treat it early and reduce the progression to the more advanced um, NASH. And currently, there are no approved pharmaco. There's no approved pharmacotherapy for fatty liver disease, so for NAFLD, and this is an area of a very intense, ongoing investigation. And the medications that have been studied, such as vitamin E and the thiazolidine dione pioglitazone, are generally recommended by the society for patients with biopsy-proven NASH. But what really has been shown to work very effectively in clinical trials is weight loss in patients with fatty liver disease who are overweight and obese. In fact, the studies have shown that with greater than or equal to 5% weight loss, you can get 
significant improvement in liver fat, so a reduction in steatosis. With greater than 7% weight loss, you can get a high proportion of patients to have regression of NASH or non-alcoholic steatohepatitis. And with greater than 10% weight loss, you can actually have a reduction in fibrosis in those patients that are more advanced, or at least avoid a progression in fibrosis. So this is very, very important. The issue is, though, is that this type of weight loss in these patients is not only very difficult to attain, but very difficult to sustain after um, weight has been lost. And there have been some some very interesting studies. In fact, one that was published in Nutrition last month by Isabella Franco and her colleagues um, in Italy, looking actually with patients who had fatty liver disease at evidence by a fiber scan, was called a controlled attenuation parameter score, indicating significant liver fat. And these investigators looked at a low glycemic index Mediterranean diet, either alone or in combination with different um, regimens of physical activity. And at 45 and 90 days, found very significant improvements based on reduction in cap in liver fat with the diet and alone, actually, but even more so with the diet and physical activity. So I think a structured program to help with weight loss that includes both the dietary intervention as well as physical activity is very important. We need to support these patients and maintain and, and not only get them to hopefully lose this degree of weight to improve the liver fat, but also to sustain this over time. And I think this can go a long way in reducing risk of cardiovascular disease for these patients, of other comorbidities, as well as reducing the progression to the more sort of serious, if you will, form of fatty liver disease or NASH. That's an excellent summary. With that, let me introduce Jerry Mabry from EchoSense, who will introduce his colleagues. And these three folks will talk about the Liver Healthy Program. Jerry, Mike's all yours. Thank you, Roger. The Liver Healthy Program is an integrated lifestyle modification program provided by a consortium of three GI companies. Echosens is the provider of the central non-invasive diagnostic. Cronwell is the provider of the chronic care management services. And Modify Health is the provider of the medical food and dietary support services. Executives of all three companies are here to explain their respective companies' role in the Liver Healthy Program. To begin the introductions, I am Jerry Mayberry. Uh, my background is uh, in biology, but my career has been spent in product development. I spent 21 years as vice president of product development at Sandhill Scientific, where I developed and commercialized a series of impedance-based products for GERD and swallowing disorder diagnosis. Starting in 2005, I worked with the founders of Echosense to establish FiberScan in the United States and ultimately launch Echosense North America. Now I would like to introduce Joe Rubenstein, founder and CEO of Cronwell. Joe, please tell us about your background. Thank you, Jerry, and thank you, Roger. It's a pleasure to be here. I'm Joe Rubenstein. I'm a physician uh, by training, but a technologist at heart. Back in 97, I started GMIT, which was the premier healthcare IT provider for independent GIs. We automated their office, and we sold that company in 2015 to Modernizing Medicine, but we're back with a great team to get closer to the patient and uh, help physicians uh, reach many more using digital tools in this post-EHR world. Thank you, Joe. Now I wish to introduce Hagen Jordan, Chief Commercial Officer at Modify Health. Hagen, please tell us about your background. Sure. Thank you, Jerry. Uh, so a little bit about me. Postgraduate school, I've had the pleasure of spending really my entire career over 15 years in the GI space with incredible companies like EndoChoice and Boston Scientific Endoscopy. And really what I've been focused on is working with healthcare providers to commercialize really innovative products, whether it's in the flexible endoscope space, anatomic pathology, infection prevention. Really what I've been focused on in my career is just identifying problems and trying to meet a need uh, working with providers and their patients. Prior to Modify Health, starting Modify Health, I was with Boston Scientific Endoscopy where I led their ambulatory surgery center channel and and really, you know, left a, pl a great place like Boston Scientific because of this great opportunity here with Modify Health and Liver Healthy to make a really big impact on providers and their patients. Really excited about what we're doing here. Thank you, Hagen. Now I'd like to provide some expanded details on the objectives of the Liver Healthy program and how the three companies' capabilities synergistically combine to achieve the short-term and long-term lifestyle improvement goals. The Liver Healthy program 
program is designed and administered as a therapeutic tool for obesity and NASH management based on early stage disease identification. Our intent is to implement effective long duration lifestyle modification starting early in the history of the disease and thereby cost effectively and clinically effectively mitigate the well-known adverse events of unchecked disease progression. Using a managed lifestyle modification approach, Liver Healthy is designed to achieve 5 to 7% weight loss and normalization of the FibroScan CAP score, thereby targeting improvements in both cardiac health and mitigation of liver steatosis. Our intent in the Liver Healthy program is to be the cornerstone therapy, which is applicable in the natural history of fatty liver disease, spanning from early NAFLD all the way to fibrotic NASH stages. This approach has immediate utility in the pre-NASH drug era. Additionally, we submit that this managed lifestyle modification program will remain applicable and even be synergistic with NASH drug therapy once those therapies are available. As you would expect, the first step in an effective lifestyle modification program is to identify which risk factor patients will benefit from the program and also to establish index diagnostic values on which outcomes can be based. Liver Healthy Program qualification is based on specific BMI and metabolic health factors derived from both fiber scan testing and blood markers done at the participating GI practice. These test values are shared with the patient in an understandable manner to compel corrective action. At program completion, these tests are repeated to validate outcomes and the values are shared with the patient to motivate long-term lifestyle improvement. You know, it's critical that we identify as many patients as possible to fall into this protocol. And so the first step in moving forward is doing a, a high-level reconnaissance at, at the lowest possible cost. So tapping into the provider EHRs and doing a low-cost screening process to identify patient at risks. And as we we determine which are of highest risk, uh, try to understand what are the interventions, what are the lifestyle parameters, and what is the information that we can gather to make the program more personalized and more effective. Ideally, we have great technology on the back end that is analyzing tapping on the risk factors, creating a customized program, and then informing uh, human care coaches what is the most effective intervention to move the needle on, on reducing that uh, BMI. The key here is to do it with little friction to the practice. We have to allow doctors to continue on their high volume, very important work and not disrupt anything they do. So you've got to think of this as a white glove service where there is absolutely no heavy lifting by the practices and the providers themselves, where we identify, enroll, deliver care coaching, track the progress and the outcomes of the program, and deliver alerts and, and relevant information to the electronic health records so that the interventions can come both from the provider and the care coach in, in tandem, and ultimately insert the charges so that they can include it in their monthly batch of uh, charges or their daily batch of charges. Um, when adopting Liver Healthy, the physician sees those risk patients for obesity or type 2 diabetes or high cap scores and recommends enrollment to, to look for weight reduction, diet and lifestyle modifications with tracking those outcomes that we're talking about. That's really hard because behavioral modification is very sensitive to personal lifestyle. And so we have to adapt that program accordingly. So a coach will reach out, discuss the goals, the motivations, the challenges, challenges and fine tune that plan to make sure that the person's deeply engaged with the goals. Using technology, we can truly stay close to that patient, whether it's through digital scales or multi-channel communications, texting, phone, and other digital means, and ultimately applying some cognitive behavioral strategies to keep the patient engaged and, and, and uh, monitor the symptoms, the exercise, and diet. The program only lasts a few months to a year, depending on on the patient's progress, and we focus on frequent early engagement 
to drive early results and keep patients engaged. And later, we'll do it a little bit less frequently. Ultimately, we want the patient and the provider to be well-connected and well-supported. We want the providers very informed and very responsive, and we want to help them come into the new world where new pharmaceutical interventions will appear and will payers will demand value-based care systems that are based on outcomes and lower costs, hence the digital component of the program. Thank you, Joe. Now we're going to turn it over to Hagen Jordan to talk about the Modify Health components of the Liver Healthy program. Hagen. Thank you, Jerry. As Dr. Farias alluded to earlier, we all know the data demonstrating the importance of medical nutrition therapy for NAFL and NASH patients, and, and we believe this will continue to be the case for NAFL patients even in the coming pharmaceutical era, particularly with the projected high cost of pharmaceuticals. Um, and at Modify Health, our mission is to make medical nutrition therapy simple and effective for providers and their patients for multiple disease states, but specifically for patients in the Liver Healthy program We provide a a simple, structured nutrition program, which includes home-delivered, medically-tailored entrees based on a Mediterranean diet, as well as ongoing dietitian coaching and support. And in conjunction with Liver Healthy, the Modify Health team works alongside the patient's patient care navigator that Joe just alluded to, uh, to make it very clear for the patient what lifestyle changes are needed, even on a daily basis, to achieve the targeted weight loss goals. So we provide the meals and the food recommendations directly to the patient, and then their patient care navigator and dietitian walk alongside the patient the entire way to help ensure the successful outcome that we're looking for. So we believe at the end here, by teaching and demonstrating to the patient what proper nutrition looks like, both tangibly by providing the food and dietitian support, you significantly can impact the odds of long-term lifestyle modification for the patient. Well, Roger, I'm very excited about such a project that includes lifestyle intervention um, with reinforcement of diagnostics. My question for the group is the following. Can you be more specific and give me an example? If I'm in a gastroenterology clinic, what would you do for for Ms. Smith, for an example, if you find that patient, how you find it and how you start and what you're going to do? And I think it's really exciting. I want to know the details. Joe, this is probably closer to your turf. Do you want to take it? Sure, absolutely. So imagine John Smith attends the physician practice and it's his first visit. We have detected that he's overweight and he's indicated that he consumes some alcohol. So we thought it would be a good idea to screen him. We are going to run a quick EchoSense CAP score and we might draw some blood samples to figure out if he's got any liver enzyme alterations. And if we detect some signs of risk, we are going to invite him to participate in the program, which starts out by having a conversation with him, making sure that his insurance covers some of the basics. We will explain the benefits of the program. We will query him and the internet to understand some of his personal profile. If there is any co-payments involved, we will let him know. Normally, Medicare patients have no co-payments. We will then go ahead and formally enroll him in the program. We will send out some equipment for him to follow through, including a digital scale, and introduce him to his care coach. We will start tracking when he received the equipment, his baseline weight. We will take a thorough questionnaire for his lifestyle. We will design the right interventions to make sure that he's following through and coordinate with Modify Health the right diet plan for the patient. We will send out the right meals, and we will indicate the right goals for the patient during his coaching session, and the process begins. Then we will check initially on a weekly basis to understand how he's progressing with respect to weight reduction, some exercise, and his meal plan. And we will provide the gentle nudging that is required to keep him on the right path to start out with a 3% BMI reduction, then moving on to 5%, and moving on to 7%. And in the process, tracking some of the laboratory values and the necessary cap rechecks to ensure that we are progressing along the lines of of, of the right outcome path 
at the lowest possible cost. This is the happy path where we've detected a patient inside the office, but we also screen for the last year's visits to understand if there are patients that have high BMIs or abnormal liver tests that we should screen and call back into the office sooner. Um, Don, the next question is yours. My question is about patient receptivity. So you described a happy path of a patient who was identified, who already has some connection to the system and is aware of their diagnosis. So if our patients with fatty liver disease, perhaps who have a high BMI for many years, who may have failed in a prior weight loss effort, who may even have other concurrent conditions like diabetes and high cholesterol, how do we help this time, this opportunity be different from the viewpoint of of creating and facilitating successful changes? And how can we help our patients be receptive to this information and to this approach and not be shocked by, by this program, particularly if this is the first time that they're just being confronted with this information? That's a great question. So liver healthy is part of a wider chronic care management program. It's not the only condition that we're dealing with. It's a program inside chronic care management. And so a patient that has multiple conditions will be participating in one or more programs to manage those conditions. With respect to the patients that are not easy to respond to weight loss programs and the like, most of the weight loss programs in the past have relied either on lifestyle or generic health warnings, but they rarely have had a clear sign of a underlying metabolic condition, whether it's the enzymes or whether it's the CAP score. And the perception of the patient under this program of an underlying metabolic disease is much stronger than the perception of overweight as a generic problem. We are changing the conversation from you're overweight to we have a condition that is affecting your liver that could be very dangerous and we need to move quickly on reducing your BMI. And so we found a lot more reception to that discussion than than a generic discussion. Could, could I add something to that as well? So w- with respect to patient engagement, certainly in our practice, we most of our patients have attempted weight loss in, in the past and have, have unfortunately not succeeded. So I think a, a program like this that integrates the diet, some medical nutrition therapy with physical activity, with a coach, and I think very importantly also with a, a metric that they can be following, I think is, is, is very motivating to the patient, you know, whether it's me showing them the fiber scan and explaining to them what the cap means and what that means with respect to their liver health. But it, you know, it becomes just very engaging with the patient when they see that that's improving over time. And whatever the metric might be, you know, their, their weight on a scale, the cap score coming down on the fiber scan, if they have diabetes, their hemoglobin A1C coming down. So I think this is all a lot of very positive reinforcement. But I do think, again, that you need the the structured program and what, they, you know, what, what I know this program, that's sort of the beauty of it, that it is sort of very multifactorial, if you will, to, to help the patient achieve their weight loss goals. And I also think that they're realistic goals as well. Many patients go into weight loss, you know, really want to lose unrealistic amounts of weight. But I think starting with 3% or 5% is realistic. And that also is very motivating to the patient. I'd like to make two points if I could. I very much have appreciated this answer. The Global Liver Institute has been involved with our our partners, including the Obesity Society. And as we're recording this, as, as we're having this conversation, we're participating in obesity City Care Week. And so much of that advocacy is against weight bias and stigma. So we know that simply confronting someone about their weight can actually create negative feelings of, of depression and guilt and hinder changes that people would otherwise like to make towards their health. And so putting in the context of giving the visible information from the fiber scan, for example, and to Dr. Frias's point, anchoring it in a, a metric, a number, and an outcome is, is really fantastic. I think that patients will be receptive to this very comprehensive approach, structure, and direction that has been lacking in the field to date. So, so I wanted to thank you for the, for the approach uh, from that patient-centered perspective, but my additional question is about the family. So putting in place some fantastic intervention for an individual, even as personalized 
utilized as we're making it in this program for their own health and health care, and particularly ad- addressing comprehensively the issues of fatty liver disease and diabetes and other concurrent conditions. We must be very much anchored in the family, food, meals, exercise patterns, uh, community exercise activities that are, you know, the ecosystem that surround the individual and really can make or break success. And so how do you help people bring their family into this as allies and and make sure that um, there's no undermining of these efforts or counteracting? How do you help align the family and community with the direction that the patient is being helped to take with this program? Thanks again. That's a great question. Uh, the challenge that we're driving with right now is that the, the program starts off under standard chronic care and remote patient monitoring codes or remote physiological monitoring codes. And so it's really starting off more with the elderly population, um, the, the, the patients above 65 years of age. But we're seeing some of the private payers actually jump in with some good thoughts so the story of adopting technology to give him the signals that that drive behavior not only to the patient but also to the to the family is is still in 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 evolution i mean it this is this is only starting out with medicare patients we expect that that integration of the ecosystem will come along with the private payers expanding the program just beyond the the Medicare population. No, it makes a lot of sense. I'm not saying that I'm not saying that they're not involved. What I'm saying is that the ability to involve them using technology is in the infant stages. I guess if the Medicare patient does live with a family, you know, having constant positive reinforcement is going to be critical, but you're running the double challenge of a marginal adoption of technology and b lifestyle improvement where only a fraction of them live along with their families. And so that's why I'm saying that it's in the infant stages. That being said, yes, the ecosystem, the support system, the caregivers, the family all have to pay a key role. And and that's critical. And you're absolutely right. Thank you. Thanks, Donna. Um, Two more questions, one from Mazen and one from me. So, Roger, we have data on weight loss and exercise. And previous literature has shown that losing 5% help losing the fat, 7% theatohepatitis, and 10% lead to improvement in fibrosis. And we usually try to target that 10%. Nevertheless, unfortunately, majority of people, more than 90%, don't lose weight. And one of the exciting things about this program, as mentioned earlier, there's reinforcement, there's behavioral therapy treatment, and there's the diagnostic component, people usually want to come and see their fiber scan improving. So with the failure rate I mentioned in previous trial and the well-designed program, what is their projection for success rate in this program? And if any of the organizers can tell us, what do they expect to get uh, with their program in terms of weight loss? Thanks, Maz, and that's a great question. Before I turn this over to the liver healthy people, I would like to note that the program talks about a 5 to 7% decline in uh, relative decline in weight not a 10%. So I do not anticipate that they will have currently or in the future data on the fibrosis issue necessarily, but certainly the steatosis and the steatohepatitis, uh, 5 to 7% is well within the bounds of what the program anticipates. And with that, let me turn it over to the Liver Healthy team to answer. Absolutely. The program is just in pilot mode right now. It's uh, barely being launched. And so we expect to collect enough data within the next, call it three to six months, to have a pretty clear indicator. I mean, the outcomes parameters are very clear. You know, BMI reduction in CAP scores and liver enzyme variations. And the short answer is, you know, let's talk again in somewhere around the summer, maybe the fall. And hope, and we'll have you guys back at that point in time to talk about that, which would be great. I agree with everyone's assessment about how exciting this program is. I do have one question that arose from two comments yesterday, one from Dr. Frias, that the challenge over time is to get people to keep the weight off. And then, Joe, I believe you said that we anticipated this program would be several months in length. I'm wondering either what in the program or what systems are in place to support people as they continue past the end of the program? And at what point in time do you think that'll be? Juan Pablo, you want to take it first and I'll take it second? You know, I, I don't know the answer to that question as far as what the program has. I mean, my, my answer would, would be, as I was hearing that question, was that, you know, it, it's good to see that this program will evolve over time and, uh, from my understanding, will also be integrated into pharmacological approaches when therapy is available for for fatty liver disease specifically, but we clearly have medicines today that can be used for a 
obesity. In fact, there was a recently published paper in JAMA, I was part of that publication, the semaglutide step three trial, which looked at intensive lifestyle intervention initially and followed with semaglutide therapy once weekly and continued lifestyle. And those patients did phenomenally well and, and were able to maintain their weight loss. So I think something will need to be done, I imagine, from a program perspective to follow these patients over time and continue to motivate them. But I think also integrating with new therapies that will likely not only address obesity, but type 2 diabetes, as well as fatty liver disease, um, will be very important. And Dr. Frias, that's what I wanted to pick up on, the opportunity that we've seen from the beginning and that this seems to really be able to address patient multiple metabolic factors to comprehensively um, address the whole patient. No, I agree. I mean, the, the disorders are like so inter intertangled, if you will. I mean, fatty liver disease makes diabetes worse and diabetes makes fatty liver disease worse. So I think if, if you do have an intervention that can, as you're saying, address multiple metabolic conditions, I think it makes it even even stronger and more powerful. So, And just to complement that, uh, to complement that, that process, I mean, the at the beginning of the program, we are certainly learning our way and, and understanding truly what are the most effective interventions for the different types of people. But over time, you'll see us also internalizing a lot of that knowledge under a self-sustaining digital ecosystem. You've got 80 million people that, that are at risk here and, and treating them would require a huge, you know, army of nurses. Um, that That's not practical with the current reimbursement systems. And so you have to figure out a way to augment each individual nurse with a ton of technology. And so the, the short answer to how do you make these programs scalable and sustainable in the long run past the, uh, the acute stage is by leveraging technology technology to continue in a positive reinforcement loop and to keeping patients on track to an ideal target set and to keeping them stick. Look, those are all good and important points. And I believe we have enough uh, answer. We have enough questions, and enough answers to fill the 10 minutes that that would normally take in the um, podcast. I will get Mazen to dictate his question back in. Other than that, we're Do you folks have any comments in closing that you'd like to share? I think this is a fantastic and ambitious effort. Um, notably in pilot stages, but we will be looking forward to receiving more information on it and to maybe bringing you all back on the podcast when you've got data in a few months and giving us an update on what you've got. Anything you want to close with? The only closing comment is, you know, we're in an age where we truly need to augment humans to, to help humans. And the only way to get through that scale process is is through smarter and smarter and smarter system. It seems like a, a simple problem, but it's a very complex problem to solve. And I'm glad that we have a great set of individuals and people keenly focused on the problem so that we can all together, you know, move the, the, the progress bar constantly up. First, I hope everybody enjoyed the episode and the extra sode as well. This week's news from Surfing Nash covers three questions. Some fantastic listener numbers and power. The severe challenge is pulling this episode together. And some questions and thoughts we have about exactly how to cover Nash Tag in two weeks. Let me start with the good news first. Listener numbers are growing. The listenership numbers have been fantastic. Does uh, anybody remember maybe uh, two months ago when we were really excited to hit a 1,000 download plateau for 30-day podcast downloads and 400 Google page views made for a big week? Well, that was so December. Now it's beginning of March. We've averaged over 1,000 Google page views a week for the last five weeks, which is 150, 200% more than we were doing previously. Over that time, our rolling 30-day podcast download number has consistently run over 2,000. This past week, it's been somewhere between 2250 and 2350. And these are getting frighteningly close to top 5% numbers. I'm certainly within small medical categories. It's a pretty big set of people who are showing up and helping us by listening and being part of our community. Also, since we dropped the Nash Carrick episode uh, this past Wednesday evening, Nashtag has seen 32 more virtual registrations for the event. Now, I'm sure most of that was general meeting momentum, but if any of our listeners decided to attend after hearing the podcast, I'd love to know about it. Please post to one of the discussion groups on LinkedIn or Facebook, or send a note to info at surfingnash.com. Get your scorecard for this week's recording casualty count. I mentioned before that Mike Wilson really has his work cut out for him this week. Uh, no one likes to watch the sausage being made, so I'm not going to go into all the gory details of pulling this particular episode together, but I will give you a casualty count. Normally, we have one session, and we can do everybody on one take. This time, we had four sessions. We had to do retakes of seven of the nine different people who were talking, and we had Mike cutting in things from at least six different places to make it happen. So, Mike, hats off to you. Everybody else, enjoy listening. It's not always as easy as it sounds. Please help us decide how to cover Nash Tag. 
Finally, looking for opinions on how to cover an ash tag. If you heard our easel or ASLD coverage last year, you'll know we highlighted certain presentations that were maybe 15 or 20 percent of the total meeting content and discussed only those. Nash tag with its single main stage and highly interactive presentation schedule will be tougher to do that way. And also, as Steve and I mentioned last week, the intellectual ferment and sidebar discussions are a major part of what makes the meeting work. So here's what I'm thinking. Do an episode after each of the four major sessions. Uh, That may be a little hard to do right after the evening sessions because they end at 8 o'clock in Salt Lake, which is 10 o'clock in New York and 3 or 4 in the morning in Europe, depending upon whether you're in London or on the continent, or even 5 if you're a little further east from there. In each session, devote a limited amount of time to recapping what was in the presentation so that more, maybe even most of the session is dedicated to the people in the session, the KOLs and surfers, sorting out, so what does all this mean as a discussion? C, keeping an open comments and questions line throughout all of the national take sessions so that anyone who's attending and plans to listen to the podcast and send a question for us to address during the podcast. I'm exploring whether there's a way to let some of you hear our recordings in a lot in real time, but I don't know whether that's going to work yet. And if I thought it was this past week's technology issues scared me. Those are the three thoughts. Episode after each session, make a lot of it about what does it mean as compared to simply sharing data from the sessions, open comments and questions section for a session for anyone to share a question they want us to address, maybe even the ability for some people to be part of an audience. Okay, I'll be putting these issues up in a post on LinkedIn and Facebook Wednesday night or Thursday morning. Please come to the bulletin boards and tell us what you think or write us back at info at surfingnash.com. And with that, I'm done. I have many, many people to thank. Jerry Mabry for his nearly infinite patience and calm in organizing Deliver Healthy Crew. Jose Frias, Joe Rubenstein, and Hagen Jordan and Jerry for their superb explanations and presentations. Donna and Mazin for great questions and bearing up under the technical challenges. Stephen and Louise for everything they do to be their fantastic selves. And then Mike Wilson and Eric Rounds for going above and beyond to get the episode posted on time. Given the technical challenges, the fact that we keep moving the schedule and the, and the fact that Paula Taylor is on vacation this week. Polly, hope you're having a great time. We've missed you. I'm not sure you've missed us. At any rate, we will be back on Monday with a topic that sets up Nashtag nicely and then next weekend with our special Nashtag coverage. We will post on this during the week and describe our final decision at the next episode. Until then, everybody, it's almost the end of winter. Hang in there. Stay safe. Stay warm. If you can, get a vaccine and surf on. We'll see you on the podcast. Bye-bye now. You've been listening to the Surfing the Nash Tsunami podcast. Have any questions for the surfers? You can send them to questions at surfingnash.com and we will answer on the podcast or the website. Thanks for listening. See you next week on the Surfing the Nash Tsunami podcast.